This job ain't always easy. Sometimes I have a hard time writing a script for a video, and there's a lot of reasons that can happen. Maybe I don't have a full understanding of the subject. <laughs> Not like that's ever happened. It could also just be more complicated than I realized at first, or more boring than I thought, or maybe it's just hard to put what is interesting into words. I'd say these all happen just about equally. But there's one that's less common, and that's when I realize, partway through, that what I think is one subject is really multiple that need to be pulled apart and looked at separately. And that's what happened with this script. It started out really simple. I just wanted to tell you about this motherboard, the ABIT BP6. And that should have been easy because it's by no means obscure. This was first sold in 1999 and it became an instant classic among overclockers and other PC enthusiasts. It was really a beacon of PC modding at a time when that community was still getting up to speed. I mean, let's level on this. In 1999, no major label PC had built in RGB from the factory, okay? These were dark times. If you wanted a black case, you had to buy a white one and spray paint it. If you wanted to run dual graphics cards, you had to figure out how to keep them from cooking themselves because nobody sold self-regulating fans or cases that had actually been engineered for good airflow. And if you wanted water cooling, you had to buy an aquarium pump and some hose clamps and just get to work. Let's not talk about where people got their water blocks. It was a rough time. Nowadays, huge corporations will sell you all the tools you need to make your PC look and act however you like, and both Intel and AMD will sell you CPUs specifically labeled and priced for overclocking. But back then, it was all unauthorized and DIY. Despite, or perhaps because of this, PC modding was in full swing already in 99. As soon as it was possible to make a computer do things it wasn't intended to, people went for it with gusto, not caring that they had to do it all from scratch. Overclocking in particular was so popular that folks were figuring out ways to modify their actual CPUs, up to and including drilling holes in them to squeeze out more performance. In short, this was an extremely vibrant hobby right from the get-go and the ABIT BP6 dropped in the middle of what may have been its most exciting era. Now, it's not hard to see what makes this board special. It's um, right up top, you kinda can't miss it. This board has two of them, two sockets and two CPUs that is. And there really is no overstating what a big deal that was at the time. We are completely numb to multiprocessing nowadays, to put it mildly. Nobody's shocked by a 24-core CPU. That's quaint and mundane, really, in a world where 96-core chips are old news. In fact, while writing this script, it occurred to me that I couldn't remember the last time I saw a machine with less than four. And sure enough, it seems the dual-core CPU is only hanging on by a thread. Intel and AMD do still make them, but in such small quantities that every time they release a new model, it's newsworthy. And I get the strong impression that all of these are part of their value lineup. You know, stuff you'd only get in a $150 Walmart laptop, subsidized by Bing. Quad core is just where computing starts at this point, and not just in PCs, in phones and watches and everything else. And it's been like this for so long that we just don't remember what it was like before. But there was a before. Prior to 2005, multi-core CPUs just didn't exist, outside of a couple early experiments with no retail presence. If you wanted more than one processor in 99 or 2000, you needed two physical chips in two physical sockets. A technique so novel it had an actual name, Symmetric Multiprocessing, or SMP. Now, businesses have had this in one form or another since, let's just say the dawn of time, but virtually no consumer had a multiprocessor system up through the 90s. Then in 2005, everything flip-flopped. The first multi-core CPUs appeared, the Pentium D and Athlon 64 X2, and they took the world by storm. Multi-core designs eliminated most of the complexity and space constraints of SMP, and within a year or two, virtually every computer was shipping with at least two cores. And the transition between these eras happened so smoothly and quickly that we rarely think about it. But the reality is that much like the Y2K bug, virtually all of our software was quietly altered behind the scenes to make that transition go smoothly, and nobody noticed it as it was happening, so it feels like it was always this way. Modern OSs and programs are usually designed to take advantage of multiprocessing, but back then, nothing was. So, while I remember people getting excited about the BP6, proudly showing them off on forums and boasting about their builds, I never knew what they were getting out of it. I'll expand more on this shortly, but up through the 90s, there was just no reason for a consumer to have two CPUs, and OS and hardware vendors didn't want you doing it, so you'd be swimming upstream the whole way, and this board didn't change any of that. That's why its popularity has always fascinated me. I was never sure what exactly it brought to the table. 
It was not, for instance, the first dual socket motherboard, nor was it the first one available to the general public. Those are misconceptions I had for nearly three decades, but well, here you go, a dual socket board from 1998, they existed. How about one from 97, 96, 95, take your pick. All those were sold at retail and there were more. This was old hat for the PC platform at this point. And yet none of that seems to have mattered because the BP6 was indisputably the first dual socket board that enjoyed anything remotely like general uptick. Of course, it was only remote. This was still absolutely an enthusiast product, but unlike what came before it, the BP6 sold to, I don't know, what's a large number for 99? Tens of thousands, hundreds of, a ton of people, okay? And more importantly, a lot of those people didn't have pathological amounts of free time on their hands. They were fairly normal as computer people go. And that's why, while most enthusiast products from this era have been lost to time, no matter how big a deal they were in their day, the BP6 is so well remembered that it has its own wiki page. Now, maybe that doesn't surprise you, but trust me, this is bizarre. There are no wiki articles on motherboards, okay? Not specific models anyway. There's huge lists of models, I'll grant you, but only as examples of boards with specific chipsets and whatnot. And none of the names are links, it's just plain text. And that's not surprising, because who remembers a motherboard? I mean, okay, you might remember one or two that you had at some point, and you might remember some magical summer when such and such a board was an amazing value for your dollar, but that's really what it's about, right? Every board just has the socket du jour, the chipset du jour, and they all jump up and switch chairs as soon as a new one comes out. So it's like the Taco Bell menu. The market offers dozens of models, but they're all made from the same six or eight ingredients. Compare any two boards and they'll be basically the same, just one has the cheese outside the shell. The only real differences come down to reliability, uh, quality of components, quality of firmware, whether the traces were drawn sloppily, that sort of thing. But these aren't questions of taste or innovation, they're measurements of competence. There's one right way to build a board based on the Intel Z790. You either screw it up or you don't. So if we remember a motherboard at all, it's probably just because it didn't crash at a time when most did. And usually we just don't remember them at all. The machine you had in 2005 was probably that bitch in Athlon 64 and not that bitch in DFI LAN party. Exceptions abound, but come on, you probably remember your first car or bike. That doesn't make them significant in the grand scheme of things. So if you tried to write a wiki page about any given motherboard, you'd struggle to meet their notability requirements. It would be like writing about a particular 632 metric bolt. You can just summarize it on the page for bolt. So how did ABIT do this? How did they manage to make a motherboard special enough to qualify for its own blue link? Well, let's see if the article says. The BP6 was an ATX motherboard released by ABIT in 1999, the first board to allow the use of two unmodified Celeron processors in dual SMP configuration. This, combined with its overclocking capabilities, made it a popular option among enthusiasts. It's been credited as the product that made multiprocessor systems affordable for mainstream users because prior to its release, the expense made it a feature only for workstations. Okay, fair. I don't intend to contest any of that. I mean, there's one or two nitpicks, uh, but it's all pretty much true. The problem is it doesn't really explain anything. Uh, all the facts are correct, but there's no context, no details as to why earlier boards cost more, why this one was so cheap, if indeed it was. And unmodified Celerons? Modified in which way? It's yeah, it doesn't really tell you anything, and none of this is stuff I didn't already know. I've had basically this same summary rattling around in my head since 1999 because it's the same way people explained the value of this board back then, and they didn't give any more details either. So if the BP6 was the follow-up or alternative to something, nobody ever said what it was. And for many years, I just filled in the blanks from my own experience. I assumed that before this board came out, an SMP motherboard must have cost an unholy fortune, required special CPUs, special memory, and a special case and power supply, all expensive, all hard to get. And that's because I used to work in e-waste in the late 2000s and 2010s. So I saw dual processor machines from this era, and that's what all of them were like. Let me show you an example. This is an HP NetServer LH2, and it's uh, pretty much the first retro machine I ever owned. I got one of these back at my first e-cycle job in 2007, 
which I guess means it really wasn't that old. It's only about 10 years. Although I suppose that counted for a lot more back then. At any rate though, in 1997, this is what you'd expect a dual CPU machine to look like. An unholy hulking abomination. Just the cover from this thing weighs more than your average consumer PC. And the rest of the thing isn't exactly built like one. The CPU and memory, for instance, live on their own daughter board. And now I kind of got to come clean. I lied a little bit. This is not the first retro machine I ever owned. Uh, mine was the original NetServer LH made in 1996, I believe. But that kind of makes my point to be honest because that machine had a pair of Pentium Pros. This machine has a pair of Pentium 2s. In every other regard, they're pretty much identical. Whether it was 96, 97, 98, it all blends together. Multiprocessor machines were just enormous, uh, incredibly heavy, and packed with tons of functionality that the average user couldn't possibly hope to take advantage of. Uh, for instance, let's get some of these cables out of here. All right, this thing has 10 expansion slots. We've got uh, five PCIs up top, and then five E-ISAs below that. Then we've got two SCSI ports, independent controllers. There's another uh, couple of SCSI ports on the back. And if we spin this around, We've got a six drive SCSI array on the front packed with uh, 9.4 gig drives. Each one of these would have been about $300 in its day. So we're looking at uh, a $2,000 array that gets us just under 60 gigabytes. And then around on the far side, we've got space for two redundant power supplies, each one about twice the size of a normal ATX PSU. So yeah. This thing is a behemoth and it was priced appropriately. These started at about $12,000. There's no question, this is not a consumer oriented machine and no consumer really could have used it, but I'm cheating here, right? I mean, as the name and the SCSI array suggests, this was not meant to be used by a person. This was meant to be a server. Might not look much like one for our modern eyes, but you gotta remember rack mount didn't really become ubiquitous for another few years. Back in 97, 98, your corporate domain or your corporate website was very likely hosted on something like this, just sitting unceremoniously under an unused desk in a cubicle somewhere. Let's try something a little bit fairer. Okay, this is a, a bit more human scale. This is a Dell Precision 420. Man, how many machines do I have at this point that have the weed number on them? It's gotta be like six. This thing is a tiny bit newer. It's from late 99, early 2000, something like that. But it's nearly identical to the model they were selling two years earlier, the Precision 410. It's clearly far less of a juggernaut than the net server, but it's still pretty damn big. And if we open it up, it's clearly not any more normal inside. In fact, before we can see anything at all, we have to flop down the incredibly proprietary hinged power supply. That's, that's right, this thing has a two-piece articulated die cast aluminum hinge. If you've ever seen anything like this, you've traveled longer roads than I have. And if you're curious, despite this thing's incredible bulk, it only delivers 400 watts. How quaint. And the only reason it even provides that much is because, again, you were expected to put a whole rack of SCSI drives in here, uh, quite a lot of startup current. In fact, this actually has two separate 12 volt rails, uh, the orange and the yellow. Uh, so when the hard drives spin up, it doesn't uh, trip the power supply. Not uncommon nowadays with big graphics cards, but pretty unusual back then. This also connects to the motherboard with two separate connectors, neither one ATX, but why two? <laughs> you got me, uh, especially because it's clearly not necessary. If we pop open this guy up here, uh, this is actually space for a, a much more ATX-like power supply because Dell actually reused this same sub chassis and board for a different version of the 420 in a, a desktop configuration and they use a completely different power supply for that even though it has all the same capabilities. Huh? Huh? 
It also plugs into the motherboard with only one plug. So why do they need two? And if this model of the machine somehow needs this weird shaped power supply, then great. But why did they leave in the mount for the other one? The mind reels. It's almost like they were just burning R&D capital for heat at this point. It's incredibly hard to really uh, get a sense of how this thing is shaped because it's just so complicated in there. But take my word for it, that's not ATX, okay? This board has three different power inputs. It's kind of shaped like a Tetris block. It definitely wouldn't fit in a normal case. And again, it's got a whole bunch of stuff that no consumer would ever need. We've got SCSI in both uh, 50 pin and 68. Uh, we've got AGP Pro, though you can't see it because it's covered up by a full length GPU in 2000. There's also something down here that looks like 64-bit PCI, but that's actually a proprietary slot for a Dell RAID controller. Uh, oh, and last but not least, there's the memory. Instead of taking the nearly universal SD RAM, this used RAM bus, which ran hotter, cost more, and was much harder to find. So to sum up, the machine may be more mundane than the net server, but it still has a bizarre design. It takes bizarre components. It uses expensive RAM. It's got strange peripherals and both it and its older brother, the 410, had MSRPs starting at over $4,000. So you can't blame me for thinking that dual CPU machines were just weird and expensive back then. And judging from the general vibes of the era, everybody else seemed to feel the same way. So next to this weird thing, the BP6 really does look like a breath of fresh air. It's refreshingly dinky. It would fit in a normal case. It takes ordinary SD RAM. It doesn't have a ridiculous number of slots, has no SCSI, and it costs under $200. This is clearly a board for an average Joe. The question is, what were average Joes doing with them? So when a BP6 crossed my path recently, I snapped it up, not even really intending to make a video. I just wanted to satisfy my curiosity. And well, it sure did get satisfied that and a lot more. To understand what using this was like, I decided to build a more or less period accurate PC and run more or less period accurate software on it. And this turned out to be productive, informative, and a total blast. All right, and there it is. This is the machine that I built. Doesn't look like much, does it? But remember, back in the day, almost everyone's rig was a sleeper. Nowadays, it's hard to find a PC case that doesn't have some kind of gamer flair, but in 99, this is what pretty much everything looked like, unless you took matters into your own hands. Uh, to wit, Maximum PC's September 99 Dream Machine, supposedly the bitchinest system they could assemble, used a virtually identical white box. Uh, this is an Nlite 7250, which is a lightly updated version of the 7237, which was everywhere in the late 90s and 2000s. Tons of people had this exact case or one just like it. Max PCs doesn't say Nlite, but I strongly suspect it came out of the same factory because it has the same weird quirk. 99 was late enough that very few people had those horrible cases with the single piece U-shaped chassis that we've been suffering through for years. Good riddance to that nonsense. At this point, you could pretty much assume that you'd have individual side panels on your case. But notice on this one that the grips are at the front, not the back. And if we look at the back, there's no screws. This thing's kind of like Biff Tannen's car. If you don't know the trick, you'll never get it open. You have to tilt it up and pull a hidden latch under the faceplate. That pops off and then the side panel releases and slides forward. It's, um, it's a bit awkward, but it is at least toolless in an era when, for God knows what reason, thumb screws were a lot less common than they are now. Anyway, with the machine open, it um, still doesn't look very impressive. But again, this is as it should be. In 99, motherboards didn't yet come in the vibrant colors we have now, like black or white. They were all either generic circuit board green or a few shades of brown, ranging from crusty old tube radio to baby shit. This board is the latter, so it kind of hides even in the light. Plus, the primitive interfaces we used back then, like parallel ATA, made cable management virtually impossible since it's really hard to zip tie ribbons. And you could get the electrically dubious rolled IDE cables, but 
I always felt those looked worse than the ribbons did. So it was always a mess. Even in professional photo shoots, you could rarely see a PC's motherboard for all the crap piled on top. So this actually turned out pretty clean, but it still doesn't look as impressive as it should. Nowadays, high-end hardware is always dressed up in florid paint jobs, decals, fancy heat sinks, flashing lights. But at the time, you could look at a top of the line rig and have no idea what you were seeing. That's exactly what's going on right now because this machine actually kicks ass. The um, paired DVD-ROM and CD burner, that alone would have been a real statement at the time. That's like $500 of hardware right there. Uh, the motherboard and CPUs amounted to another three to $400. This is uh, 256 megs of PC100 RAM. That's the fastest you could get, and that much of it would run you another $300. There's also the GeForce 256. That's a 32 meg GPU that came out a few months after the BP6. So it was absolutely scorching new and it was a real screamer. This would run you another $300. Now, the 3Com 10100 Ethernet, that didn't cost that much, but what it didn't say about your budget, it did about your lifestyle. There was really no point in having one of these back then unless you had a home network, incredibly early broadband, or you went to LAN parties, all great extravagancies. Now, I do have to admit, though, to two anachronisms. One, the sound card here, that's a Vibra 16. These were still being sold, but, well, you wouldn't have been caught dead at a LAN with an ISA card, okay? I picked that, however, because for some reason I've had terrible luck getting PCI sound cards to work on old machines. Some kind of weird curse I've got. The bigger problem though is the hard drive or lack thereof. For reasons I don't wanna get into, I just couldn't get a real hard drive that worked with this board. So I actually have a compact flash card in here in an adapter. This is probably 10 times faster than any contemporary spinning disc of the time. But since the underlying interface is just plain old IDE running at the bog standard ATA33 speed, I don't think it makes that big a difference compared to a decent contemporary hard drive with low fragmentation. Now, I should point out, this machine may not have SCSI, but it does have the closest consumer equivalent. There's two white IDE ports over there, and those connect to a high point ATA66 controller. That could theoretically deliver twice the performance, but was widely regarded as unreliable and really inconvenient to boot from, so most people avoided it. Now, if I really wanted to make this thing scream, I would have put in a decent PCI hard drive controller, but honestly, this is good enough. We have a ridiculous loadout for 99. This machine outstrips the aforementioned maximum PC dream machine in pretty much every category, and you'd know it to use it because this thing feels good. All right, this is probably gonna be really loud. Ooh, yeah, that is loud. Hopefully it's not too loud for you. Okay, good, it works. I was worried I would destroy it when I took the board out. All right, if I hit pause right about there, uh, we can see our 256 megs of RAM and our dual Celerons. That, that, that can't be right, right? Surely, surely I meant Pentiums. But your eyes do not deceive. This is what the board came with when I got it. And it's what everyone who had one of these was using back then. Weird, right? Yeah, much more than you can possibly realize. And this is actually core to the narrative, but we're not thinking about that right now. We're, we're just gonna experience the machine as is and we'll do our thinking later. What I will say up front though, is that this machine disappointed me in one respect. You see, I brought up overclocking several times earlier and that was a big part of this board's cache, but I don't think I'll be able to demo it because the base speed of the CPUs that came in it is almost the maximum that the silicon can handle. 500 megahertz is pretty much as hot as these chips got. All the same though, since I'm getting in the BIOS anyway, we might as well give it a shot. Uh, this is a completely bog standard BIOS, you know, the, the award thing that <laughs> went back to like, I don't know, 1989, 1991, somewhere in there. Incredibly bare bones. Um, you don't even have a proper boot selector. It's just CD-ROM, C, A, Good luck if you want to boot from USB. Anyway, this does have one feature that wasn't so common back then, which is the CPU soft menu. <laughs> I love the exclamations. Now, we're all used to this nowadays, but it actually used to be an ABIT exclusive feature. At the time that this board came out, much of their competition still required you to move jumpers on the board itself to change your CPU speed. Here, however, it's trivial. We just go into the soft menu and, and we can just uh, flip through various predetermined speeds here or set this to user defined and pick whatever bus speed we like. So this chip comes at 66. I know it won't go to 100. Let's try pushing it to 75. See if that works. <laughs> 
Oh, hey, look at that. It posted. Okay, 563 megahertz. That's a very normal speed. <laughs> But it is a bump, I'll take it. Um, in fact, we could probably go even harder if I picked like uh, 76 megahertz or something, but honestly, it'd probably get pretty unstable. Uh, I have not tested this and I'm actually just gonna go right back to 500 because otherwise all my benchmark numbers for this video will get thrown off. But this still makes my point. If you got this board with the much more common and cheaper 300 megahertz or 366 megahertz chips, like most people did, this BIOS made it really easy to push them to 500 megahertz or beyond. And that was definitely a major aspect of the board's popularity. Anyway, if we continue booting, the next shocker you'll see is that I'm running Windows NT 4.0. It's, it's also the server version, don't, don't worry about that. Server workstation doesn't really make any difference for our purposes. The weird part is the NT4. Now, this probably looks a little shinier than most installs. By default, NT looks pretty crusty. I've dressed it up, made it look a little lived in, sort of like hanging draperies in a Quonset hut. But even with the makeup on, NT is just a very strange thing to see on a home computer. And this too goes straight to the core of the matter. If you wanted to see that all-powerful pair of CPU gauges, this is what you had to run. Remember that normal people never owned multiprocessor PCs back then. This was a business feature as far as the entire industry was concerned. So Microsoft only supported SMP in their business OS, NT. Consumers would mostly remain on Windows 98 for a couple more years until Microsoft merged the code bases into XP in 2001. And that means that if you decided in 99 to swim against the current and build a dual proc machine, you had to commit to the bit, sign away your membership in the consumer realm and walk away from Windows 98. Now, let's not mince words. That didn't mean you had to run NT. There were alternatives. They were just impractical for most people. Linux, OS2 Warp, and BIOS were all retail packaged OSs you could just go out and buy, or in Linux's case, download if you had a fat enough pipe, and all three supported SMP. The trouble is, well, from what I've read, OS2 only supported it in a special version and the support wasn't very good. BIOS supported it perfectly, but had basically no software and Linux, well, Linux was actually a pretty good choice if you weren't gaming. Unlike Windows, there was no split between consumer and business editions. It was all just Linux. So you got the best version of every driver that existed and every hardware feature that it supported all for free. And on a personal and highly biased note, since this was the first era of Linux I used, I also feel it was the high point of the OS's usability. I mean, it wasn't super accessible to end users, but if you were the least bit savvy, it was a good experience. The documentation was decent. The UI wasn't a constantly moving target like it is now. It was pretty dang stable and a great suite of free software by the standards of the time. It looked cool as hell and it was far more secure than Windows and it had also supported SMP since 1996. So a copy of Red Hat 6.1 would get you every advantage your dual CPU box could offer, assuming you were happy with just free software. Naturally, almost everyone I encountered back then wasn't. They were all gaming, and that was a far worse experience on Linux than it even is now. You were pretty much limited to a handful of Loki ports and Tetris clones and not much else. So if you built one of these machines, you were probably running NT. I wouldn't be surprised if you've never actually seen NT4. It's not a popular OS to look back on. And to be honest, even though I ran it for a bit back in the day, every time I try to go back, it's like tripping on cracks in the sidewalk. It looks a bit like Windows 95, but it isn't, not quite. I mean, don't get it twisted. Mostly you'll be at home, you know, Explorer, is just Explorer and the start menu is exactly as you remember it. You can arrange icons on the desktop and run most of the software you're used to. Here, let's um, make that point. Okay, here's QuickTime Player. Here's WinZip. Here's ModPlug Tracker. You might not have used this much back in the day, but I definitely did. Then we've got Adobe Photoshop, uh, a program that's remembered now mostly for its contributions to Something Awful's image editing contests. And finally, we've got Quake 3, a very popular graphics card benchmark. All this stuff runs perfectly, just like it would on Windows 98, maybe even better. And that's probably because I'm running Service Pack 6, the last major update for the OS. Now, I'll be honest with you, I didn't have the patience to try it on SP4 or earlier. I've heard it was a lot rougher back then, slower, less reliable, worse gaming support. But by the time the BP6 came out, SP6 had as well, so I don't see a point on dwelling on that particular past. This is the experience you would have had. And let me be frank, I love it. 
My time with this machine has been delightful. I've enjoyed using this more than any other retro PC I've ever built. It's fast, responsive, and rock solid. I haven't had a single crash, even when testing flaky graphics cards and video drivers, and every piece of software that I've tried to run has worked perfectly. By and large, this does feel like Windows 98, except the UI design is tighter and it's more stable. But it does take some getting used to. For instance, uh, Windows 95 introduced the concept of the device manager, a central location where you can see all the hardware in your machine. You can uninstall things, update drivers, scan for new components, and just get a general idea of your whole system loadout all in one place. NT doesn't have this for some reason. There is a system properties, but there's no hardware info in here. So if you want to see what kind of video card you have, you have to go into display properties, go to settings, click display type, and this is where you can see your graphics card driver and change it. Okay, suppose you want to update your sound card driver. We have to go into the control panel, go to multimedia, go over to devices, drill down to audio devices, and here is the driver for the sound card which we can update through a completely different interface. Wait a minute, can we even update the driver here? I, I just realized this. I don't think I can. Yeah, I, I think in order to update this, I actually have to remove it and then re-add it. Great stuff. Okay, what about a network card? Suppose we install uh, a new NIC. Okay, we have to go into the network control panel, go to adapters, and here we can actually update the driver, except it's another completely new workflow. We actually have an update button here, except there's no browse button like there is in the video drivers. You have to type in the path for the new driver. And if you just want to get an idea of what hardware is in your machine, you have to go in here to administrative tools and run the Windows NT Diagnostics app. Now, I'm obviously nitpicking here. This is not a real problem. It's just that if you're used to Windows 95 or 98, if that's what you use most of the time, then every time you have to go back to this, you got to relearn it all, but you pick it up pretty quickly. The point though is just that everything is a little different than you're used to. And worse than that, there are some things that actually don't work. While Microsoft would sell NT to anyone who wanted it, they never intended for consumers to run it. So it cost more than 98 and it commanded a far smaller market share. It was thus largely ignored by consumer software and hardware vendors who weren't really bothering to test anything on it. Now, by the time SP6 came out, the OS was pretty stable and Microsoft had made it a lot more compatible, but you gotta remember, all the stuff I was running earlier is super mainstream. Quake 3, Photoshop. There were lots of obscure apps out there that had never been tested on NT, probably never been tested on 95. People were still running stuff from the Windows 3 era, and some of that stuff would straight up refuse to run or just crash. And if you were a gamer, huh, you were in for a real treat. Regardless of Microsoft's level of support, vendors treated the OS like dirt. You could look forward to outdated and broken drivers for your 3D accelerator, your sound card, and your game controllers, plus DirectX updates that lagged in frequency and quality. People were still reporting Direct3D issues well up into the SP6 era, and even when a game didn't crash, you would sometimes just get totally corrupted graphics, which unfortunately are a huge phobia trigger for me, so yeah, I did not have a fun time on NT back then. Now to be fair, this was just sort of par for the course. I remember playing Lithtech games on my crappy Radeon 7500 and just having most of the textures missing, and that was under Windows 98. Plus, a lot of 3D accelerators just never worked correctly at all. But the fact remains that NT could turn a good card into an unusable one, wasting a big chunk of your $3,000 investment. And your only option was to switch back to 98, or at least dual boot, and that meant you were wasting a whole second CPU. But the question we've been dying to answer is, what good was that second CPU back in these days? And the answer is really complicated. So I've done my best to make it as concise as possible. In other words, it's time for slides and diagrams. Generally speaking, there are two ways to leverage multiple processors, multi-threading and multitasking. The first one, multi-threading, is the really juicy option. It's what we use in benchmarks to make PCs really look fast, but it's also much harder to implement and benefit from. The second, multitasking, is a lot more mundane, but it probably does the lion's share of the work in making SMP worth it even today. All the same, both of them are critical in making multiprocessing worthwhile. 
Here's the basic problem. A conventional program is made up of a series of instructions that execute in a fixed order. The CPU acts on each one, then moves on to the next in a mostly predetermined order, and there's no way to divide up a program like this to run it on multiple CPUs. Each action depends on the results of the last. So if you just take random instructions and assign them to another processor, they'll execute out of order, trying to act on data that doesn't yet exist. You'll have chaos. So the first step in using a second CPU is to figure out how to safely break up that workload. The most basic way to do this is through multitasking, a core feature of all modern OSs. A single core CPU can only work on one task at a time, so to allow the appearance of simultaneously running several programs at once, we segment each one into a task or process. If you open two copies of WinZip, you'll get two processes, each one self-contained, each one able to execute on its own schedule independent of the other. Then an OS component called a scheduler divides your CPU's time between each process. It lets one task execute for a few milliseconds, then pauses it and executes the other for a few milliseconds, then repeats. Both tasks get to use some of your CPU power, but neither one can take all of it. The PC, phone, tablet, or even smart TV that you're watching this on is heavily multitasking even as we speak. OS's run dozens or hundreds of processes to handle all the maintenance and background requirements of a modern computer, and that's before you launch any actual apps. So when multi-core CPUs came along, we were able to take advantage of them right away. Since processes are already self-contained and the scheduler is already swapping them on and off a single CPU, why not swap them between two? And it's as simple as that. Any multitasking OS can easily take advantage of multiprocessing, even if none of the user's apps are SMP aware. And this works great until you run a really heavy task, like a video encoder or a file compressor that uses all the power of a whole CPU. This puts you right back where you started with one big bastard workload taking up a whole CPU. The OS scheduler can't break it up and spread it around to your multiple processors. The developer has to do that by splitting the program into threads. Threading is another operating system feature that lets a programmer divide a program's instructions into two or more threads, which are almost like processes within a process. They execute on their own schedules, they don't care what each other are doing, but they share a common chunk of memory and are governed by a parent process instead of just the OS. Now, threads were useful long before multiprocessing existed because they made it easier to create responsive apps. When Photoshop is running a really slow filter, you don't want the window to be frozen the whole time. You'd like to be able to see the progress bar moving, but with the filter using up all the app's CPU time, there's no opportunity to update the user interface. To fix this, Adobe moved the filter code into its own thread, separate from the interface, and this lets the OS scheduler get its grubby hands deeper into the app. Now it controls when each thread can execute, letting the filter code run for a few milliseconds, then pausing it to let the UI code run for a few milliseconds to update the screen, and so on. So the same way that processes prevent a single app from monopolizing the PC, this ensures that no single function can monopolize a whole app. Threads are thus an essential part of good software design even on single core machines, but again, since the code in each thread is already designed to run independently of the others, you can safely assign them to different CPUs. Of course, there's not much point in just putting the UI on one CPU and the filter code on another. Once again, one will be slammed at 99% while the other is barely doing anything. What you really want is to break up the filter itself by, say, having one processor handle the top half of the image while the other handles the bottom. In theory, cutting the filter time in half. And that's exactly what many developers do. A lot of software nowadays has core algorithms divided into threads so it can take advantage of as many CPU cores as you have. The trouble is, doing this is a huge pain in the ass. Adding threads complicates the hell out of software design, and in a lot of cases, you'll see no benefit on single processor systems. So for years, particularly before multi-core CPUs existed, very few developers were willing to put in all the effort. And who can blame them? There was really no return on investment. So unfortunately, most software won't run better on this machine just because it has two CPUs. Let me show you that. So I've got this great big zip file here. Ignore its anachronistic contents. I'm gonna extract this to my desktop. All right, away we go. And now let's take a look at Task Manager. All right, what do you know? Uh, almost exactly 50% utilization, or half of this machine's true potential. And it'll never go higher because WinZip isn't threaded. It's stuck on one CPU. Well, we see both CPUs getting hit, but as far as I can tell, that's just because Windows uh, bounces processes back and forth between your CPUs, at least in, in this version. I have no idea why it does that or if they stopped doing it at some point, but uh, it certainly doesn't improve performance since WinZip is only enjoying the power of one CPU at any given moment. And this is kind of heartbreaking, right? 
We've built our killer rig. We put in all this money. We stooped to installing NT4. We paid our dues. Do we get nothing for our trouble? Well, okay, let's, let's take a deep breath and get rational here. This is not an ideal test. For one thing, WinZip is probably spending a lot of its time waiting for the hard drive to read or write data. That's unavoidable. And it's not multi-threaded and probably couldn't be. A lot of algorithms are hard to parallelize, uh, to split into multiple threads that run at once, but on different parts of the same data set. Uh, in fact, from what I can tell, most compression software didn't add multi-core support until the early 2010s, and even now, it's not clear if and when it applies. There's some chatter out there about 7-zip and WinRAR only using multiple cores if you pick specific algorithms, or only speeding up compression or decompression, not both. So. Even as we speak, if you go unzip a big file, you might find that your 4, 8, or 64 core CPU sits mostly idle. And there are many other things that don't parallelize well, but I won't get into that because it's really easy to give bad examples. Uh, for instance, it's commonly said that video games are overwhelmingly single-threaded, but this seems to be either outdated or just semantics. What isn't disputed is that it's really hard to add threads to a game or to anything, really. Multi-threaded programming sucks, and very few people like doing it. So in this era, when there were no clear benefits to SMP support, virtually nothing had it, except for enterprise software, stuff like databases and web servers, which needed as much power as they could get, already had huge programming teams working on them, and were incredibly ideal use cases, since they needed to serve a lot of completely independent requests simultaneously. Now, I can't demonstrate SQL Server or IIS for you, but fortunately, there's a very juicy option that straddled the enterprise and consumer markets, and that was content creation. By the way, if you're like me and you find that phrase incredibly irritating, you might be even more annoyed to learn that they were already using it 25 years ago. Big sigh. Image processing, video editing, and 3D rendering all got SMP support really early, and that means that an ideal target market for this specific machine might have been a freelance CG artist. If you were making cutscenes for video games, for instance, you might have had Photoshop, Adobe Premiere, and Autodesk's 3D Studio Max installed. And if you did, you'd really be smiling because all three of those took advantage of the dual CPUs as best they could. And naturally, I have all three of those apps on here. Now, I've put these through their paces and results were mixed, so we're gonna start with the best showing. This is 3D Studio Max, and I'm not sure how popular it is anymore, but at least back in the 90s and 2000s, this was the backbone of CG, at least in the game industry. Uh, in fact, let's go jump into the program folder. So there's this unassuming images folder here, and these are all uh, promo renders from various Autodesk customers. Let's just open a couple of these. All right, so we've got a Zerg and a Terran from StarCraft. I don't know if these are uh, cutscene frames or promo shots, but they're definitely from the game somewhere. We also have something just called newlaser.jpg in lowercase, and that turns out to be uh, promo art from some kind of Star War. I think this is the box art for X-Wing Alliance, if I'm not mistaken. There's also a couple of uh, Tombs Raider in here, which I have to assume were used for like um, uh, magazine advertisements, that kind of thing. I also know that Blizzard used this to make all the items and characters in Diablo 2. So yeah, this was big. The app comes with a bunch of good sample scenes, but I particularly like this mechanical bug. Hi, I'm gonna render this guy at 640 by 480. Uh, that was a perfectly reasonable resolution for the time. Okay, that frame's done. Now, if we hit render again, and then take a look at the statistics, we can see that that took 10 seconds to render that frame. And if we go over to Task Manager, we can see that both CPUs got hit pretty much to 100% uh, while we were rendering that. Now, let's go over to the Processes tab. Uh, a neat feature of Windows NT is that it allows you to select which processors a task is allowed to run on. So let's just turn off one of the CPUs and render this again. Now, it is visibly slower, first off. All right, and now let's take a look at the statistics, and it says 17 seconds, or nearly twice as long. Shocking, right? Twice the power, half the time. Who's surprised? Isn't that why you bought the machine? 
Well, yes, but this is still an incredibly generous test case. 3D rendering has always been the poster child for a very highly parallelizable task. Non-real-time rendering in particular is very well suited for being thrown at a bunch of independent CPUs. That's why CG movies have always been rendered on enormous farms, often made up of ordinary PCs. So it makes a lot of sense that a 3D package would get SMP early on because it's well suited for it and the audience is people for which time is money. To give you an idea what I mean, uh, there is an animation included in this sample file, just sweeps the camera around the bug. This is 150 frames long, and at 30 frames per second, that's about five seconds. So at 18 seconds per frame, it would take 45 minutes to render this. If you made a tiny error and only discovered it after it was done, that would really sting. You're losing a whole hour and change to fix it. But at 10 seconds per frame, you'd have time to render, discover the error, then render again, all in the space of one hour. So 3ds Max is really putting this machine's best foot forward, and that's no surprise. Ray tracing is so ideal as a parallel processing task that we're still using it to benchmark just about everything, and probably will be forever. Let's take a look at a slightly less ideal example. Photoshop, like I said, should be an ideal SMP workload, but I've had really mixed results, so I'm not sure what's gonna happen here. So I'm running version 5.5, which came out in 1999. Supposedly it had multiprocessor support going back to at least version five, so we should be golden. Let's load up our SpongeBob here. From what I understand, not every part of the program is optimized the same. Uh, in fact, I found a whole bunch of people on Usenet bickering about whether this version of Photoshop had any real SMP support at all. Certainly, it appears that some filters do, some don't. So I've been testing with Sphere Eyes, and that seems to work. So let's see what we get. All right, that took about 10 seconds. Let's run it again and compare. Okay, that was 12 seconds. Let's run it again. Okay, 12 seconds, That's that seems to be about the average. And we can see it's not hitting the CPUs nearly as evenly as 3D Studio was, but it's definitely hitting them. Yeah, it looks like about 75% mm, max. Definitely not the 100% that we'd like to see, but it's using them. So now let's uh, take away one of those CPUs. Do it again. All right, that was more like 16 seconds. Now, is that consistent? Yes, it is. Okay. So a difference of 12 to 16 seconds, not tremendous, but as we can see, it's only using about 15% of the second CPU anyway, for whatever reason. So this isn't the massive improvement that we hoped for, but it's more than marginal. I'm not sure if it was worth it per se, but maybe if you're doing a thousand filter operations a day, it would add up. Certainly it is doing something. Let's look at another example that's uh, perhaps a, a bit more ideal. Adobe Premiere was just about as popular back then as it is now, I think. Uh, it was certainly a big deal at the time, and it had supported multiprocessing for at least two versions, I believe. You can actually see right here, it says two processors. So it's definitely picking them both up, but uh, version 5.0 said the same thing, and I couldn't find any part of it that ran any faster. So I switched to version six, which actually came out sometime in 2000. So it's a bit late for this machine, but it's close enough, right? So I made this little test project here and uh, uh, all this is is two clips with a transition between them. But of course, uh, these are the days before hardware acceleration. So you can't actually see that transition until you render the timeline. So let's do that. All right, away we go. Now, if we look in task manager, it's uh, definitely hitting both CPUs. Looks like it's getting up, ooh, 90% plus. That's outstanding. And we're rendering at about it's uh, five and a half, six frames per second, it looks like. Okay, not too bad. Let's see how long this takes. All right, we're finishing up here, and that whole render took just about one minute, four seconds. And as we can see, uh, both CPUs were getting hit pretty consistently the whole time. So let's uh, go in, uh, turn off processor number two, and we'll try again. Right off the bat, we can see it's maxing out CPU one, and our frame rate is down to uh, 4.2 FPS. Oh, it's going even lower. Are we gonna get down to three? Yeah, it looks like it's settling around three and a half frames per second. So not quite half, but pretty damn close. All right, we just hit 104. We still have a third left to go. All right, and it looks like we uh, finished up around one minute 36. So that added, uh, almost half again the total render time. 
not the night and day difference that you'd hope for, right? You'd hope it'd be twice as fast, but this would still knock half an hour, 40 minutes off of rendering a feature length presentation. And that uh, basically proves that, <laughs> oh man. And as soon as I exit, Premiere crashes. All right, now this, this is an accurate experience for the time. God, Adobe stay winning. They're still like this. Anyway, this proves pretty clearly that for at least some people, dual CPUs could definitely be worth it. But even for our notional game developer, it wasn't necessarily ideal because while the dual procs might have helped you make the models, the cutscenes, and the textures for a game, they wouldn't help run the game itself. Making games multi-threaded is a real brain melter even today, and there was no argument for doing it at this point in time. It was an immense amount of effort for literally no return, so nobody did it. The only exceptions I'm aware of were Quake 3 Arena, which offered SMP as a buried opt-in console flag, and Falcon 4.0, which only really had it in theory. That game was designed for Windows 98, and it generally wouldn't run on NT4 at all. So the threading was either intended to improve single CPU performance, or maybe the devs just wrote it on a really early beta of Windows 2000, because apparently that existed all the way back in 1998, and people who tried it said it ran the game like gangbusters. I didn't even know Win2K betas existed that far back, and I doubt most people had access to them, so I'm sure this prospect wasn't gonna send anyone running out to build a dual socket rig. And as far as Quake 3, <laughs> oh boy, let's, let's fire that up. I'm just gonna load up a demo here. Every time I do this, it's weird because I'm just not used to seeing Quake 3 take any length of time to load. It's been like, it's been like 10 seconds, we're still loading. All right, there we go. And as you can see with our bitchin' GeForce 256, it's running like gangbusters. And it's kind of hard to say, you know, conclusively when games are CPU bound or not, but I guess this one is. It usually was the case back then. And we are getting 50%, uh, 51 in Task Manager, so we can assume that this would benefit from more power. So let's turn on SMP. We do RSMP1. All right. From the menu, we do our SMP1, and then we do vid restart. And now let's run our demo again. Oh, terrific. Uh, it's definitely taking advantage of both CPUs now. We're hitting uh, 85, 87% utilization. Uh, also, the game is completely unplayable. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, this was a really mixed bag. Uh, there were people who saw significant improvements in frame rate. I found at least one magazine benchmark where they got like uh, 15, 20 FPS extra, I think. But other folks saw tiny decreases. And for a lot of people, the game either got really unstable or it ran like this. So yeah, this, this was pretty much a non-starter. And from what I understand, they never patched it. Uh, they released this as like a beta alpha feature and never made any improvements. Things weren't any better for the other powerhouse title of 99, Unreal Tournament. Uh, again, it has no SMP support whatsoever. So as you can see, we're uh, not getting any more than 50% CPU utilization. Not that you can really see the game either, because for some reason a lot of games had messed up gamma back in these days and, and the in-game adjustments didn't work. But at any rate, uh, it's running just as well as it would on one CPU, because it is running on one CPU. Despite Unreal being a cutting edge engine, arguably more advanced than Quake 3 in a lot of ways, they never added SMP to it until I think several major releases later. And neither did anything else. This was the tragedy of early multiprocessing. It was possible, and it had been possible for much longer than most people probably realize, but in practical terms, very little could take advantage of it, at least in a vacuum. It wouldn't make your zips extract faster, but if you were willing to accept less obvious gains, if you will, then there was still plenty of value to be had. In 1999, if you were a hardcore computer dork, you would probably find yourself playing UT99 at a LAN while abusing the host's T1 to download stuff from FilePlanet with GetRight, while playing music in Winamp, and running four different IM clients. Now, none of those programs were multi-threaded, and UT was still gonna be slamming one of your chips to 100%, but the machine was still gonna feel a lot better to use than the one next to it running Windows 98. Of course, this all depends on exactly which apps we're multitasking with. If I'm running Quake 3 while extracting a zip file, uh, even though both tasks are single threaded, and even if I manually assign them to two different CPUs, Quake 3 still runs like crap. Maybe because WinZip's constant disk access is saturating the system's IO. Maybe because it's putting heavy demands on system memory. I don't know, but it doesn't work very well. 
And you couldn't use Photoshop at full speed while 3D Studio was running a render either, but if you tried anyway, the experience would be a lot smoother than on a single CPU machine. These advantages are so subtle that you can easily let yourself believe they aren't happening. Uh, for instance, when I was getting this machine prepped for this video, I had to move a bunch of files over using FTP. So I started a big transfer, and while that was in progress, I installed a couple programs, played some music, stuff like that. Uh, later on, I picked up that big Dell workstation that I showed you briefly earlier, and I decided to set it up with basically the same software. So I put NT4 on it, and again, I had to move a bunch of stuff over via FTP. Now the base clock speeds of both machines are about the same, but that Dell only has one CPU installed. And to my surprise, it was totally unusable until the transfer was complete. Even while trying to make a video about the value of multiprocessing, I failed to pick up on what it was doing for me. I just forgot that computers weren't this fast back then. The benefits of SMP have always been vague and hard to pin down. They still kinda are, and yet we would never consider going back to single core machines. And likewise, I think anyone who owned one of these dual socket rigs back in the day probably swore off single socket systems forever. This thing was a game changer. And so, that's my ABIT BP6 machine in the most roundabout way possible. It's a fun PC and a great way to experience computing in the Matrix era, if you ask me, but it wasn't supposed to be a video. Like I said, I built this machine for myself. It, it wasn't really supposed to ever be in a video. I had no intention of writing a script about it because I kind of figured that it was redundant. The VP6, after all, is by no means obscure or forgotten. If you just Google the model number, you'll find comments on Reddit, on forums, YouTube videos, blogs, all from people who have never gotten over this thing. And for good reason, the board actually mattered. It was culturally significant. There were thousands of forum posts about it. There were magazine articles. It had its own entire website, bp6.com. In the year 2000, Leo Laporte was telling people to build this exact rig on the screen savers. I've been running Windows uh, 2000 on my BP6 with the dual Celerons and been very happy with it. If you're buying for today, get the Pentium 3 600. If you're buying for next year, I'd say the dual Celerons are a better way to go. Certainly I'll, cheaper. I'll go with that. This board deserves to have a wiki page if only because it's the single motherboard in all of history that people can actually name for a reason other than it being the first one they ever bought. But why is that? What made it so special? The description on the wiki page is correct, but it kind of raises more questions than it answers. The first board that could do all these things, sure, but why? And then what happened? And why this company, this point in time? And why was there no competition? How come I never heard about anyone running dual overclocked Celerons in an Asus or a Soltec or a Gigabyte, even months after the BP6 came out? The wiki page has no see also section, all right? It seems like the BP6 wasn't just first, it was the only. And besides that, what's with the goddamn Celerons? When someone starts reminiscing about their dual CPU machine that they had back in the 90s, they always say they had a pair of Celerons. Uh, Wikipedia calls them out too, and this board came to me with two of them installed. What's this about? That's Socket 370. It's the same thing I saw on every Pentium 3 I ever owned. And sure, those were more expensive, but I remember people dropping ridiculous sums on PCs back then just to show off, just for a lark, just as a bit. So where's the guy reminiscing about his dual P3 500? There should be at least one, but I never came across any. Now I wondered about these questions for, truth be told, 25 years. I didn't understand it at the time and it never came clearer in the interim. It wasn't until I had the board in my hands though that I started really needing to know what was going on back then. Once I got it though, I went looking for answers and it really didn't go the way I expected. I kept running into walls, kept coming across facts that didn't gel, didn't fit together. Nothing was making any sense and after a couple days of fruitless searching, I knew I had to be missing something, making some faulty assumption. So I threw out all my preconceptions. I started at the beginning and just began reading through the history of Intel CPUs one by one, trying to figure out what I'd missed. Slowly, it all came into focus, and I realized that I'd forgotten or missed a huge chunk of CPU history. For those who get mad at me because this video could have been 10 minutes, good news, it turns out the explanation is very succinct. It comes down to three facts. First, you couldn't put a Pentium in this board because at the time, there weren't any that fit it. Second, even if there were, you'd have been a fool to buy one because they cost a fortune. And third, even if you had the cash, you'd still be a fool as far as a lot of people were concerned because it was commonly felt that Celerons were the best CPUs on the market.
Now, none of those things make sense. The Pentiums were always Intel's flagship and the Celeron has always been a joke. It's the chip that comes in your mom's computer, the one that makes you grimace every time you have to use it when you're visiting because everything is just a bit slower than you know it should be it's the consolation prize, the also ran, the chip no nerd has ever willingly bought, except for a brief moment when we actually loved them. I had vague memories of people actually being excited over Celerons back then, but I never understood why. And as quickly as it started, it shifted to the way it is now, where nobody would dare speak of buying one on purpose. I was almost unconvinced that it really happened, but it did. When this board came out, the best CPU on the market by many opinions was a Celeron. And yet, as you'd expect from the name, Celerons were the cheapest chips on the market. The BP6's popularity ultimately came down to a simple question of cost. The other boards I briefly showed you at the beginning of the video were available to consumers, and some of them were fairly reasonably priced, but by that I mean two to three hundred dollars, you know, a decent price for a motherboard at the time. The BP6 wasn't reasonably priced. It was priced like dirt. It cost around $150, putting it neck and neck with the worst boards on the market. And even that wouldn't be so impressive, except that it also took Celerons, which cost about 80 bucks at a time when a decent Pentium was around 400. So the entire rig, board and chips came to less than the price of a single flagship processor, yet you still got flagship performance. The extreme cheapness wouldn't have counted for anything if the chips were crap, but they weren't. With this build, you got top of the line perf for the price of a bottom end machine. And I'll explain how that was possible in part two, because for once I've decided it doesn't make sense to tell this whole story in one go. This video is just about the BP6, and now you should have a good idea what it was all about. You've seen the board, you've heard the pros and cons of using it, you've seen what using it is actually like, and you've seen that it's seemingly totally normal by modern standards. And yeah, it's raw technical merits aren't what landed this thing on Wikipedia. What earned this board the blue link was its cultural significance. But even that was only a high watermark, signifying the end of a very strange chapter in computer history. I wanna tell that story, but the full context is incredibly deep and wide. It covers four years of Intel's history, and that just doesn't deserve to get buried under a thumbnail of a single motherboard. I needed to explain the BP6 because it's the only connection most people have to this era, but it was simply a footnote at the end of four other stories. Those are the rise of consumer multiprocessing, Intel's struggle to deliver consumer viable CPUs in the late 90s, the bizarre history of the Celeron itself, and the sheer enthusiasm underpinning the early days of overclocking. All four of these threads collided and reached critical mass in late 99, and the resulting explosion was so strong that it burned an abit shaped shadow into culture that persists decades after the company itself folded, but that was only the end of the story. In part two, I'll start at the beginning. It's gonna be fun. And if this video was fun, that's great. Glad to hear it, because I can't even tell at this point. This is like my third attempt to shoot this thing, because the first two times I got to the end and realized I'd made a video about a motherboard where I totally failed to talk about the motherboard. This is always a risk when writing. I started out planning to make a BP6 video, but then I spent two weeks researching the thing. By the time I actually put pen to paper, I'd almost forgotten the board existed. It ended up just being a means to an end, and it deserved better. So hopefully I gave it its due this time around. So if you enjoyed this, I really hope you'll stick around for the second half. If you're new to my channel, remember to subscribe and turn on notifications if you wanna know when that comes out. You might also wanna subscribe if you just like having videos to fall asleep to. I'm told my stuff is good for that. But if you really liked this, then consider supporting me on Patreon like these folks are doing. This is my full-time job and it's the only way I can make this channel work. It takes weeks of effort to put something like this together and my patrons make it possible for me to put in the time these subjects deserve. They also give me a budget to buy rare components and equipment and pay my rent and groceries and whatnot. So I'm incredibly grateful to all of them for making this possible. My channel wouldn't exist otherwise. Thank you all so much for supporting me and to everyone else, thanks for watching.